I am going to talk to you about something not technical. Um, uh, it's a little bit more about culture and a bunch of random stuff. So I hope you'll be, uh, it'll be interesting. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about whether you're a software company yet. Let me say, why in the world should you become a software company? So first of all, uh, from my point of view, software is not an end thing. The real world is about manufacturing, it's about airlines, it's about food, it's about politics, which is not even real world, but it's ignore politics, but, uh, you know, healthcare, that's the real world, right? Software is a tool. It's not a thing by itself. It is a thing you use to make something useful, more productive, more valuable, better for human beings, and so forth, right? So when, I, when I'm talking about are you a software company, yet, I'm not talking to software companies because that's completely pointless. I'm talking to normal companies that do something real, not as software people who don't do anything real, to, tell, to ask soft, normal companies saying, are you there yet in some sense, right? Now, why in the world should you become a software company? It's really simple nowadays, right? You don't need to be a rocket scientist to understand. Tyler referred to uh, Mark Andreessen's essay that was written in 2011, by the way. If you haven't read that, Google that up. There's a New York Times article written in 2011 by Mark Andreessen. And if you don't know who Mark Andreessen is, Google that up. It's fully worth it. And basically, everything is powered by software. Simple. That's it, right? It's not just business. Everything is powered by software. This particular, I just put a random, this is an article I read a couple of days ago. Uh, how many of you read this article? Anybody read this article? A couple of people. Okay. This thing is incredible. This is a gadget. This guy is a grad student at MIT right now. This gadget, you put on the side of the ear, and you know when you read, uh, I'm a very slow reader, so when I read stuff, I read the words in my mind. That is the opposite of the thing you should do if you're doing speed reading, right? If you're taking a speed reading class, you're supposed to do something else which I can't figure out. Uh, so I read it. When I read it, my brain is basically playing signals. This thing listens to those signals with this little thing, right, and uh, converts that signal into a query of some kind and has a Bluetooth connection to a phone and the phone runs that command, gets the output and there's a little speaker attached to this thing and it plays it back so you can hear it. Basically you can think, you can say, it's pretty early stage, it only understands a few words yet, but you can think time, you can think time and it'll tell you the time. Now it's only one directional as in it's only Thinking is only processed from brain to the, the receiver. The receiver is communicating through sound yet, but that will also probably change. And it's not bad. You, apparently, you have to think. The thing is programmed so it doesn't listen to every thought, which would be kind of bad, right? You see somebody, on, you know, some good-looking person on the street, and the thing is like, okay, that's too much, right? So you have to tell it, saying, I'm now thinking towards you, and read the article. It's really incredible, right? And then, then you can tell it, and it will actually run it. Now, I just want this connected to Google Glass so that when I look at somebody and I blink, and it, then I think, who the hell is that? And this is going to Google up and tell me right away and then, you know, tell me the history, like what they like. Wow, you like that kind of music. I like it too. So this is, uh, this is not bullshit. This is real, right? This is a, this is a PhD student right now at MIT uh, who has got this working, and it does like five or ten words. Now, if it does five or ten words today, you can imagine what it's going to do in five or ten years. Right? So that basically the brain and the, there's a guy, um, Ray Kurzweil, right? The, the, there's a Google, there's an AI guy who works in Google. He's called a futurist. I don't know why somebody's called a futurist because people, everybody is a futurist. Anyway, his, he, he has written this up a long time ago saying, we're going to get to the point where we can hold a phone and the phone will basically bridge my brain to the internet, to the, to the global brain, basically the internet. Right? And that's, this is already doing it. Right? It's, it's, it's one directional from brain and then coming back through analog back to my brain, but that'll convert eventually to sending a brain signal directly, so I don't need it. So everything's becoming software. There's a project, and there's a, this is another one that I know, there's a TED talk about this. There's a, it's a bionic leg that is bi completely bidirectional. Right? So, so all the sensors are directly attached to the brain signals, and the brain thinks that part is part of the person. Right? The brain doesn't know that it's a non-human part that's attached to the person, and it controls it perfectly fine. Right? So everything is powered by software. That's why you need to become a software company, because it doesn't matter what you're doing. It's going to be powered by software one way or the other, and so you have to figure out how to play software, right? So all this stuff that Asanka said and Tyler said and, and, and Jahan is doing is real. You have to do it. If you don't do it, you're going to go away. That's, that's basically what 
digital transformation is. It's the future of everything. It's like the Industrial Revolution. People who said, well, we don't need the Industrial Revolution, we'll do it the old way, didn't last very long. In that time frame, it took 100 years to go away. In today's time frame, companies go away in, in five years, in two years, right? A world-leading company can literally disappear in two years. So, this is a serious thing that you have to do. Okay, so, what does it take to become part of the future? That means, what does it take to evolve a business or a company of some kind to something that is able to play in this new world that you have to live in? Because, as, as you all agree now, that's not a choice. So, in my view, it's not about technology. Uh, I think Jahan mentioned this too. It's a lot more about people. There's a bunch of quotes about organizations don't transform, right? There's nothing called an organization. The organization is a bunch of people getting together to work within a certain framework and a certain set of rules. The people who work in the organization are the ones who have to make some change or transform in some form. Uh, so to achieve that, you need a certain set of ingredients. And that's the set of things that I'm going to talk a little bit about. To me, the uh, foundation for everything is culture, right? So let me talk a little bit about that. I'm going to spend most of my time on that. Um, so what's culture? Uh, culture, culture is a very abstract thing in some sense, but really it's the way you live, it's the way you act, the way you think, the way you talk to each other. It's the way you do everything every day, right? Culture is not at all abstract, it is very concrete. It is, it is the reality of life for everybody on the ground. Um, and you can have nice slides on the wall when you walk in saying this is our culture, but it's all bullshit. That's not the culture. The culture is how the person every day working in your organization feels and how they're treated by other people in the organization. There's a nice saying, people join companies, but they leave their managers. Because you can have a company culture, but the real culture in your little world is your little team culture, right? Because you don't work with, you know, in, in MAS's case, 95,000 people. I used to work in IBM, 400,000 people. Right? I don't work with IBM, I work with 10 people. Right? So it's, the culture is defined by those 10 people, not, not the 400,000 people. Uh, to me, if you want to move a company which is not fundamentally powered by software, which is pretty much everybody, right? A, no real existing normal businesses are powered by software because they're powered by something else. This all software stuff is all new. So they're not there yet, this is gonna take time. So to move that, you need to create a culture that allows a certain way of thinking. To me, that's what I would call an open culture. So what does that mean? Uh, so this, this is the way we work in WC. These, these aspects of culture are things that we have come up with over, over now 13 plus years. Uh, as things that we have found valuable to operate the company as WS2 has operated. Uh, and I'm going to use some of those to explain uh, some of these things. So, um, one of the key things about, about uh, uh, being able to work with new things and, and new ideas and new approaches is that you, you have an environment that allows people to experiment and propose ideas and fight for ideas and not feel like they're going to get screwed if something goes wrong. I, I know the person who was uh, a friend of mine who was the chief architect at, at uh, one of the world's largest insurance companies in, in Germany, and he was the chief architect there for two years, and he quit. And, and he told me the reason he quit was the culture there was so uh, poisonous that if you try to do something, everybody there, the rest of the system kind of acts against it. Because the culture is designed to protect everyone and keep status quo. Everyone's waiting to retire. No one wants to shake the boat and just, just keep going, right? And, and tenured employees, right? Tenured basically means like, you know, uh, uh, Sri Lankan doctors, you know, like that. Who are on strike or yesterday or they will be tomorrow if not. Uh, uh, and so, so, so creating this, this environment that lets people to be, uh, be able to operate. So in WS Ruby, this is one of my favorite things, which is you ask for forgiveness, not permission. Right? You, if you want to move fast, there is another way of saying this called move fast and break things. I think that's what Facebook's version of it is. It's move fast and break things, which is go and do something. And shit happens, yes. If it breaks, so what? It's okay. Right? Then go and do something else. Now, if you are the person who's breaking something every single time you do something, then we'll fire you. Right? Thank you very much. Go break somebody else, not us. But if you, most of the time, intelligent people won't do that. They do it, they screw up, they learn. Right? That's, and you learn and you go do something else, which is not the one that you're going to break. Uh, so there's a variety of things like that that you can do. Context not rules is very important. Actually, Netflix, uh, if, you, if you haven't seen this slide deck, this is an awesome slide deck. Netflix has a slide deck on, on uh, SlideShare called the Netflix Culture Slide Deck. Right? It, it's an absolutely awesome slide deck and it's meant to be readable slide decks, not just bullets, right? 
Uh, it's about their work culture. Uh, this was written probably 10 years ago, uh, and I don't know whether it's, uh, you know, how much they follow now because they're, uh, but anyway, it's still, the slide deck is still there. Uh, context not rules is a very important one. Context not rules basically says, don't give me a bunch of rules and say operate compl by complying with the rules, but rather tell me what is the context in which I need to operate. I, you know, we need to, it's, again, Jahan had this right in his slides. The, the thing was you start with the problem. What's the vision? What's the strategy? Then you go down from that. Set the context first, right? What we want to do is to be a player in the global uh, digitally connected apparel infrastructure. And that's a very high level one. So you narrow it down and you narrow down to particular problems that you want to go after and you go after one by one. Right? And, and set that context and let people say, just do whatever you need to do in that. If you said rules, it's like, well, okay, there's a rule, so now you have to find a loophole within the rules in order to get through. Like the tax guys do, right? That's how the tax lawyers and rich people always do this, right? They find all the loopholes. Um, and, and, and so forth. So there, there's a lot of things about, a, uh, let, let me cover this since we are talking in Sri Lanka. Uh, uh, we, we have this, uh, uh, you know, British-influenced uh, hierarchical cultural system in how we run companies. Right? If you work in any company, I'm sure you have a manager to whom you probably have to say sir or madam, and then who has to say sir or madam to his or her manager, and all that bullshit, right? Uh, to me, this is pointless. Uh, I also work part-time in the army. I'm a volunteer officer in the army, but I don't, I mean, I'm like, not, not even work, but whatever. There, you have to say sir or madam, but that's slightly different, because there, when you're told to go and do something, you kind of, in the context of uh, real army stuff, not the kind of stuff I do, which is all bullshit software, right? In the context of real army stuff, you don't get to question and negotiate. Right? You have to do it. There's no choice because that's, you know, it's real. Uh, but in any other setting, the, the hierarchical approach completely gets in the way. If you always assume that your manager has to be giving, you have to go and ask the manager something, this is, to me, this is, this is an awesome way of devolving responsibility. Because if I have to go and ask my manager saying, sir, can I do this, no? Okay, I went to Indian, sorry. Um, uh, uh, and the answer to that is, uh, 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 and then if the guy has to say yes or no, or madam has to say yes or no, they made the decision, right? Not me. If they made the decision, if something goes wrong, it's not my problem. So it's actually great to have to go and ask somebody for permission, because if they make the decision, when shit happens, it's not your problem. The guy told you to do it. You did it. Right? But if you, are, if you are doing it yourself, and you take the ownership, then it's your responsibility. And if you want freedom, you have to have responsibility. You have to take responsibility. There's no such thing called freedom without responsibility. If you want to work in an organization and to have freedom to operate, you have to be able to take, to, willing to take responsibility. Otherwise, get out. It doesn't work. Right? So take responsibility means demanding responsibility. The organization has to give you responsibility as well. So culture has to support that. Has to be, don't tell me to go and ask for permission. Don't call in, sir, madam. Your manager doesn't know any better. Right? There was a time when, when um, uh, the way people worked was, the, you know, all the, you know, the board gets together, they have a strategy session, they have an offsite, they come up with ideas, they push it down from there, all the way down, saying pe this, people down at the bottom execute that. Uh, that world is over. Uh, yes, some people on the board might have brilliant ideas and maybe it'll come down from them, that's perfectly fine, but ideas can come from anywhere. It doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter what color you are, it doesn't matter what job title you have, it doesn't matter what rank you have, nothing. All of that stuff doesn't matter, right? It's all it's whoever has an idea, you got to latch onto it and do it, because if not, somebody else will do it, and then you lose. So there's a whole variety of things either that you have to do in order to really move an organization's ability to be, become a software company. Because if not, you end up in a situation where the, the, the company has some high-level stuff saying, we want to do this and do that, but the people are, are not conceptually and culturally, architecturally organized and able to do that. And, and what a lot of people, what a lot of organizations do is say, well, we need to become a, you know, we need to do this, we have a strategic initiative to do this, so let's reorganize. Right? They we do a reorg, this is bullshit. Reorg means just putting a different person as a manager and some other manager over here and reorganizing stuff and saying, you are supposed to do that, you're supposed to do that, and, and it doesn't work. Uh, so if you see, if you work in a company that's doing reorg after reorg, I recommend finding another job because it's not gonna work and that company's not gonna make it. Okay, so, so in the end, culture is all about people. And there are two parts to, to people. So people and, and the company have a two-way relationship, right? They, the company needs the people, people need the company. And both parties have to play the game equally, otherwise it doesn't work. 
so from a company point of view, you expect people to work hard, they, you expect to be dedicated, they to be committed to winning, you know, all of that kind of stuff. From the people's point of view, if I'm expected to do that, there has to be some ROI for me. So if I'm expected to work hard, I need flexibility so that I can manage my stuff, right? Then I'll, I'll work hard because then I, when I need to take a break or do something, there's room for it. I'm not, I'm not stuck. Uh, if I'm supposed to help this company win and be really committed to making the business win, how do I get some credit out of it? Personal brand is very important, right? Help me get some recognition out in the world so, and as an individual because in the end, it's not WSO2 that does something. WSO2 doesn't do anything. It's the people in WSO2 that do everything, right? And same for every company that you're part of, right? It's, it's not, so, so the individuals have to be given room to be visible. Uh, empowerment is very important. It's, it's very easy to have organizational models where you say, well, you know, yeah, we're all about empowered and so forth, but in the end, it's about whether people can make a decision and execute and not be held, uh, you know, damned, to, uh, damned for eternity if something goes wrong. Right? Uh, uh, this was actually, when I was in IBM, this was a big uh, thing for people. If you were ever in charge of a project that failed, the system never forgets that you were the one who owned that project, right? And you are kind of a failure forever because you failed on that one project, right? Maybe that failed because, you know, something happened completely outside of your context and that thing was doomed to fail. Uh, but the person gets damned as that. So the only option is move on somewhere else where they don't know that that's what happened and you start again, right? And, and that's a, a unfortunate reality. So you can't, you can't do that. Uh, so, so if you want to fix these things, the most important thing to me is getting an environment where people can do the best they can do, giving them the right kind of resources, giving them the right empowerment, and letting them play, letting them do their thing and, and, and get going. Uh, and and what, what, uh, if you heard what, uh, what was said earlier, uh, uh, that's exactly what Jahan is doing. They have a budget and they said, you know, we have some objectives and go do it, go play. Right, and, and produce something. And if they don't produce something, you know, Jahan will be somewhere else. <laughs> Simple as that. Uh, the other thing that, another fancy word that business people use is strategy. Uh, to me, this is a bullshit word because strategy is a result of people coming up with stuff. Right? And, and it's not only me, there's a Harvard Business Review article that came out a bunch of years ago about the importance of culture over strategy. Right? A, a, a strategy is easy, uh, you know, you can draw these strategy maps, there's all this theory about how you design strategy, you have all these protocols, blah, blah, blah. I've never done an MBA, by the way, so I don't know anything about what I'm talking about, the theory part of it. But if you have a bunch of people who are committed to doing the best thing they can do, and they know the stuff they need to do, and they have the tools to learn what they don't know, and they have a culture of learning, they'll figure it out, right? You don't need strategy. The strategy will fall out and strategy will evolve because it's also not a constant. Everything has to change all the time. Uh, I, I'm sure you, everybody in Sri Lanka knows who this guy is. Chamath Palihapitiya was a, a, was a senior executive at Facebook. He went on to form the Social Capital Partnership. If you are a, a basketball fan, he is a part owner of the Golden State Warriors. Uh, very rich guy. He, uh, he is uh, one of the top uh, VC firms in the Valley. Uh, when he left, uh, he wrote a nice letter to Facebook when he left. It was published on TechCrunch, so it's worth reading the whole thing. This is one quote that I love because it's about culture and it's, it points out that a culture is not a constant and it always evolves and it's okay and you have to keep fighting for the culture you want it to be. And it's, there's no point looking backward and saying, oh shit, it used to be so much better back then, right? Because yes, when, a, when an organization is in that time, in that frame, in that size, in that environment, it's different from what it is now, and that's okay. Uh, nor should you just sit back and say, oh, it's going the wrong way, right? If you want, if it's going the wrong way, if you think it's going the wrong way, fight for the right way. Otherwise, you, you lose the right to complain about it, basically, right? That's what it means. And it's an important aspect of culture. Okay, the second one on my list was entrepreneurship. It's another fancy word everybody throws around. Uh, I, I, I put it in here because it's, it's an important aspect of being able to evolve and innovate. Uh, what does entrepreneurship mean? To me, it's very simple. Uh, uh, when you see a problem, you have three choices in my mental model of the world. Uh, number one choice, and people in Sri Lanka are wonderfully strong at that, is complain the hell out of it, right? And we do that all the time. I do it too. We all do it. This normal human nature thing, I think. It's not just Sri Lanka. We just complain about it, saying, oh, it's terrible. It sucks, right? It's, the, nobody is doing something, et cetera, et cetera. And, and once you see a problem, if you see the problem over and over again, after a few days, your brain tunes it out. 
right? It just uh, goes into ignore mode, right? Your brain's a very intelligent computing infrastructure, uh, as we just saw in the first example I used. And a, a once uh, there is a, a once you see, keep seeing the same problem, the brain's like, this is annoyance, right? They just tune it out, so ignore it. That's the other thing that everybody does. And, the, and, and then a few people say, well, that's a problem. I'm not gonna ignore it, and I wanna do something about it. That's what entrepreneurship means. Right? And, and of course, to do something about a problem, you have to have the tools. And the tools can be a combination of knowledge. Now, uh, I, I can see, okay, you know, garment manufacturing, I can say it's not, uh, let's say, it, it's not efficient. I don't know what that statement means, but let me just say that as a problem, right? But I don't know that space. I don't know the technology, I don't know the tools, so I can't be an entrepreneur trying to fix that because I don't know that game. You have to know the problem, right? Or you have to learn it, right? Uh, to learn it, you must have the knowledge and the education to learn it. So I'm not a person who is a fan of all this, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the entrepreneurial world that is trying to create uh, copies of Mark Zuckerberg and, 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 and so forth, saying, oh, you don't need to go to university, you just, you just do something and then magically you get an idea and you can scale it to becoming Facebook. I don't believe that. I mean, that's an exception to the rule, that's not the rule. The rule is you need a hell of a lot of knowledge and you need the right tools and you need the right infrastructure and then a shitload of hard work to pull something through, right? And uh, not everybody wants to do that, right? A lot of people are perfectly happy complaining, a lot of people are perfectly happy ignoring it. Some people are bothered about by something and, and they want to do something about it, right? Those are the people you want to have. Why do you want to have those kind of people? Because they are the ones who will innovate. And what does innovate mean? Innovate means you're doing something, you've been living it all the time, and someone wants to think out of the box about it and says, why do we always follow this process for doing this problem? Why not try this other thing, right? Why not combine some knowledge you have about topic A and a knowledge you have about topic B, and then voila, you have something different, right? That is what, to me, the, the foundational knowledge about various sciences uh, is very well established in the world now. Uh, in fact, if you look at uh, major research universities, even MIT, uh, MIT has a very interesting organizational structure. MIT has departments which offer degrees and they have labs that do research. The labs are cross-departmental groups of people. Right? Johns Hopkins is just reorganizing the entire research, organization, research system in the university into that similar model where there are no departmental research projects. Why? Because you can't solve any problem being a physicist or being a chemist or being a computer scientist or being a biologist anymore. If you want to solve a problem, you need to be a physicist and a chemist and a biologist and a programmer. Right? And a mathematician and a this and a that and a this other thing and a sociologist and a psychologist and everything. So if you have a bunch of people in the department of physics thinking about physics and another bunch of people in biology think about biology and another bunch of psychology think about psychology, Great, but we are not going to get something that combines biology and physics and psychology together, right? So to do that, you need to get out of this mindset of saying, oh, we need to create isolated centers of excellence, uh, touch back on a topic that Tyler said, right? It is not a center of excellence. What you need, you still need your people who know that area. I mean, you still have to study physics to get a theoretical physics understanding. You need to spend 10, 15 years learning stuff, et cetera, et cetera, of course. But if you want to solve problems such as how do I get a leg that thinks it's an extension, if the, the brain thinks it's an extension of the thing, uh, if you watch that TED talk, that team had a, obviously mechanical engineering people, software people, medical people, physics people, chemistry people, biology people, I mean, like, you name it, that team had it, right? It was a team of like 20 people, they all had a bunch of PhDs and M, you know, MD, PhD, all kinds of combinations, because it's hard problems to solve. And, and it's done, right? And, and I mean, it's done in a, in a, in a real person. The guy, re, he was a mountaineer. He, uh, he fell down, lost his leg. They put a bionic leg and he reclimbed the mountain, right? With the brain controlling the leg, no nothing else. Uh, so it's incredible. Uh, that's a starting point. Again, these are starting points. You do that, in a few years, you're going to get somewhere. So entrepreneurs uh, are the people who innovate because they are the people who see a problem and say, that's an opportunity. What can I do about it? Right, instead of complaining about it or ignoring it. So having an environment and having a bunch of people who are, uh, who are looking to innovate is fundamentally important if you want to move an organization from the kind of the, the way it is now to what you have to be, whether you like it or not. Agility is my, my, the one I had next on the bullet. So agility, um, 
uh, is, uh, uh, and Tyler had this on, on the slides as well about integration agile, and this, I think that's what this is, I can read it backwards. Uh, uh, to me, agility is something, uh, I'm focused not on the technical part of it, but on, on from an organization perspective. So first thing is, you have to be able to, from an organization perspective, if you want to move from here to there, you have to say, I need to destroy what I have, but I need to destroy it constructively, not negatively, right? I can't not have revenue for two years while I build some new business because then you don't have a job for two years. So you need to keep the revenue and evolve it and somehow find a way to evolve the business in a way that makes sense, right? So technical people suck at this sometimes. Technical people, we, me, kind of people, I assume we're all technical people here, often forget the business reality. They say, why can't we go and do this? You guys don't get it. This is important. This is the future. You have to do it. But you also have to do it in the context of the reality of saying we have to run the business and evolve it. So, so you have to constructively destroy the business. So technical people also have to learn how to sell ideas to a business so that you can get, get on with it constructively. Otherwise, you can complain and you can fight, but you won't get the funding, right? And you won't get the support, you won't get the backing, you won't get that push to actually see it through. Second part is uh, part of being agile means when you are doing something, you got to be really passionate about that because that is what entrepreneurial people are like. That's what innovation is like, which is like you're, you have an idea, you really believe it, you go all out for it. Same time, you know, all ideas don't pan out. And just as much as you can let go, you can, you know, you can be hard, the biggest proponent and a fighter for an idea, but six months later, you might realize that this is not going to work out. So that's what dispassionately passionate means. You got to be passionate, but always be able to question. Saying, is this going to work out for me or not? Is this working out for the problem that I'm trying to solve? Is this helpful? So always being clear, saying, what is the problem we are trying to solve? If you can't articulate the problem you're trying to solve, you're just wasting time. Because you have no idea what you're doing, right? You can always be able to articulate the problem. And then you have to be dispassionately passionate about it. Uh, and so things do change. So things you did some time ago, right? This is very technical people do this all the time. Oh, we saw that. I mean, if you look at what we are building now, uh, you know, I think Tyler mentioned Corba. Uh, so Corba is an 80s technology. Uh, when I was involved in defining most of the web service standards, uh, there were IBM people who were very involved with Corba. Those guys would say, you, you idiots are reinventing Corba in XML, right? It's ugly, it's slow, it's heavy, and it's just reinventing Corba in XML. They were right to some extent, but it took off a hell of a lot more than Corba did. Corba is very widely used in a very narrow context, right? In, in phone service systems, for example, Corba is still used. Uh, but not as widely used. And then JSON people come along now and say, oh, we're reinventing this, and I'm one of the XML guys. I can look at JSON and say, what the hell is this? This is just even less efficient stuff, doesn't do internationalization properly, doesn't know what numbers are, blah, 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 but it's taking off even bigger, right? So you can't become old and jaded. So, you know, actually, just to give an analogy, Ballerina, the language that we are working on, XML came after JSON, right? JSON is more fundamental to Ballerina than XML is, because that is more natural to the problem. So you can't become old and jaded. You have to evolve with, with stuff. That's what agility means. <clears throat> okay, now let me come to the, the digital part of the part. So obviously the, the whole point about a, a business transformation is about technology. And, and uh, to me, this digital transformation word is, is another one of these things that people hire consultants to come to a company and say, tell us how we should transform digitally. This is bogus, because to me this is just about, go figure out what are the technologies that are available, apply it aggressively, and do it in a way that you can, you can back off when you get it wrong, right? Experiment, 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 retry, fail, try, catch, right? So, right, exception clause, catch it, throw it, and try it again. And it's not that complicated to do that, but a lot of people make this problem complicated. So, what, what, what are the disruptive technologies that you have to pay attention to? This is, to me, this is like the current list that if you are in some business area, you have to be paying attention to. This list changes every year, every day, right? New ideas, new things come up. So cloud computing is not even new. It's been around for a long time. It's like a given now. Uh, AI is very old, but it's kind of having a resurgence with, because of data and compute power, right? In the form of machine learning aspect of AI, at least. And there's other aspects of AI, even like this, the scenario that I described. Internet of Things, 3D printing is huge for manufacturing kind of environments, right? If you can 3D print stuff, there are 3D printed clothes now, right? There was a, there was a, uh, uh, there was a uh, fashion show with 3D printed dresses. Uh, a, a blockchain is another one of these uh, a, a, a bazillion amount of hype, but 
you know, there's one part of the world that says the blockchain is going to reinvent everything, uh, blah, blah, uh, and so forth. But uh, uh, quantum computing, uh, quantum computing is, is a, even a, uh, to me, this is the most interesting one. Uh, uh, Daimler, uh, Daimler, the guys who make Mercedes, Daimler, I was at a conference in, in Greece about uh, three, about a month ago. Uh, the, uh, the, the head of enterprise architecture was there and, and he gave a talk about what they're doing about quantum computing. The reason they're interested in quantum computing is the compute power that quantum computing will generate, will produce, uh, one uh, thousand qubit quantum computer is going to have enough compute power, uh, more compute power than all the computers in the world put together right now. Right? So, so uh, we don't know how to build one yet. We have a 50 qubit computer, uh, quantum computer now. Microsoft has one, IBM has one, and so forth. Uh, once that, and we'll get there, it'll probably take five, 10, 20 years uh, five is probably unrealistic, 10 to 20 years for it to become viable, um, and, and it changes all kinds of stuff, right? Uh, nanotechnology, autonomous vehicles, uh, mixed reality, you know, virtual reality is there, mixed reality is coming and available. Uh, power, uh, power is becoming abundant and cheap, not in Sri Lanka, but uh, we'll get there, uh, and, and so forth, right? So there are, there are technologies that you have to pay attention to if you are in a normal business, right? Now you can say, what the hell, I don't know that stuff, right? I, I know how to program. So the thing is, you can't, if you want to be the part of the digital transformation story of a business, you can't just be saying, I know Java, right? You gotta at least learn ballerina, first of all, these days, so. Uh, but beyond ballerina, you have to know what quantum computing is. You have to know what 3D printing is. You have to have some idea. How do you learn all this stuff? You don't have time, right? Everybody's busy. Uh, the bottom line is, there was a time in my parents' generation, there was a time when you could go to university or go learn for a few years and then work till you retire with that knowledge. That's over, right? If you are, uh, my, I, I'm, I'm pretty convinced I don't really need to understand quantum computing. I've tried a bunch of times, it's so freaking abstract that, you know, the way you program a quantum computer is very different. But if you are in your 20s and 30s, go learn linear algebra, abstract algebra, a lot more mathematics, right, than you probably know right now, because you're gonna need it to program quantum computers you have, in order to do that. And if you don't learn how to program quantum computers, you're gonna be a legacy programmer, not a current programmer, simple as that. So, so the, the uh, idea of continuous education is a fundamental aspect of a, of a culture that can innovate, that fosters entrepreneurship, that creates a, a ability for an organization to move to something more interesting than what it is now, something more futuristic than what it is now. The beauty of it is, uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, if you want to learn some new technology, you couldn't learn it unless you were in the top-notch university in the world. Not true anymore, right? Uh, if you haven't taken a course, uh, online course on Coursera or edX or one of these places, you are, you're sleeping, you can't do that, right? It doesn't matter, you have to do it. I took a course in Coursera, I signed up for, a, uh, I can't remember what program it is, so clearly I might not see it through, but uh, edX uh, masters, some micro masters thing on edX that's starting in September. Uh, you know, you wanna learn, I wanna learn something on blockchain, there's a fantastic course on blockchain in Coursera, right? I, I did like two thirds of it and I stopped, but uh, anyway. So, so, so the point is, uh, whatever topic you wanna, you wanna lo know about Roman cathedrals, there's a course about Roman cathedrals in Coursera offered by a professor of Roman cathedrals in Yale. 10, 15 years ago, if you want to learn about Roman cathedrals, either you have to go to Rome and spend your life there, or go meet that guy in Yale to get that course. Now it's free. Right? So, so it doesn't matter what technology topic, you can get to you know, cocktail party level knowledge in that technology topic very quickly. You can get to having a, you know, being able to evaluate technology that somebody's pushing very quickly. Why is this important? This is important because vendors, like us, will come and tell you all kinds of stuff saying this is the future, this is gonna be there, you gotta buy this. You have to be in a position to evaluate. How do you evaluate, right? Because hype, you see the Gartner hype curve, you see this analyst report, that analyst report. Analysts don't know squat either. They're listening to other people and replaying it, saying here's what the world's gonna be. They don't have a magic glass to know, uh, whatever, uh, one of those balls to know what the heck the world's gonna be, right? They are hearing a bunch of people, distilling it and playing it back, saying this is what we hear from people. Right? I'm not criticizing analysts uh, in, in a negative sense, but in a, in a positive sense, uh, whatever that means. The point is, you have to keep on learning stuff, and you can't say, well, I don't know it, tough shit, right? No, it's not possible. If you want to be part of evolving the organization into the future, you have to keep on learning everything. So how do you actually get it done? I mean, it's nice to have all this high-level stuff. Um, 
The first thing to me is, is everybody, if you're a technical person, and by technical I don't mean programmer, right? Programming is, to me, being able to write programs in a programming language is one dimension of technical competence these days. Right? Uh, you have to worry about other dimensions of technical competence. So for a technical person, you have to develop your own understanding of technology and your own vision about where this stuff is going. And it doesn't mean you understand in depth. I don't understand in depth 99% of the things I work with. But I work with people who understand, different people who, are, who understand each of those areas in depth. And then we work together to do stuff. Right? Because it's impossible for any one person to understand everything in depth. It's not possible. It's simply impossible. When you get that stuff, you have to develop some instinct saying, how do I develop my own belief, my own vision of the future? So I can think past the hype and create my own landing point saying, this is interesting for this particular view of the problem, not for that view of the problem that other people are saying. You might be wrong. That's okay. Most of the time you'll be wrong and some of the times you'll be right. Right? But at least you won't just follow along because somebody else is saying that. This herd mentality of technology adoption is very silly. Uh, and it'll kill companies. It'll kill real valuable job producing companies when you go down the wrong path with too much gusto. Right? And it'll end up in a path where you go nowhere. And it's because of individuals not being able to make judgment calls properly. And to make judgment calls properly, you have to learn and you have to learn to apply some level of abstract thinking to f formulate a position. And again, dispassionately passionate is very important. Uh, and then, then it's really what Jehan had on his slides, which is you have to prioritize, you have to figure out what you want to do, and you have to invest into it, you have to experiment, you have to try it out, and fail fast, and measure, and do it again, and keep doing it. And, and there's no shortcut, there's no, there's no end game, there's no other way, basically. All right. Um, so in the end, it's really, a, a, to me, a, um, software is a differentiator. So all that stuff, by the way, everything, whether it's 3D printing, nanotechnology, quantum computing, all of this is still programmed, right? Uh, so, so the future of the world is all about programming something or the other. But we are not programming simple, you know, uh, von Neumann architecture machines anymore. That is the direction that we are on. Uh, so so uh, if you are a business, every business has competency in various aspects, right? If you're running a company, you have to be able to do finance, you have to be able to do some legal stuff. Just like that, every company has to be able to do software stuff now. Most companies uh, assume that software can be done by somebody else for you, right? They bring a vendor in saying, oh, we are a bank, we don't need to figure out this stuff, we'll just call that company up and they'll do it for me. Uh, I, to me, that's incredibly risky in today's world. Every business has to take complete control of the architecture of what that business is. Just as much as you don't give a third party the responsibility to organize how your company runs in business operations or delivery or whatever the thing that you do, you cannot give software to somebody else. Right? You have to have complete control of the architecture of the software that you are, the overall architecture of the platform that you need to run the business. And if you don't do that, you become a slave of your vendor and you're paying for, what is it called, uh, change requests, CRs and, and, uh, uh, and so forth, right? Every little thing is a change request. You have to give them money and, and they'll, and your, your pace of innovation, your rate of innovation is not under your control, right? When something is not under your control, that's when you're at highest risk because you cannot respond to risk to respond to situations. Uh, RFPs to me is a deadly way of buying software because RFPs are a way of saying, um, here's all the requirements I might have from now until time finishes. Do you have it now? So it's fundamentally contradictory because I don't need all that shit right now, but do you have it? What's more important is, do you have what I need now and is there a path that I can see that you can do what I need to do or you are going to do what I need to do? And, and second, I don't even know what I need to do anyway. Right? Nobody knows what you need to do. That's why the second word is important. Put some lipstick on the pig. That basically means step, slap an API in front of whatever the crap you got and reuse it. Because you don't know what's going to come. Right? We don't know how long it's going to take before I'm going to do banking by thinking or shopping by thinking. But the technology is coming. So how do I, if you are a, a, a manufacturer of garments, Right? And you want to now uh, go beyond the Amazon as the, the website is no longer the place you buy. People uh, think about stuff and they are using Google Glass kind of thing or Apple Glass, the one that's coming now or whatever. And they see the things that are available and they say, yeah, I like that. They don't say, I just think that's nice. And 
It shows up three days later, custom manufactured for you because it knows your dimensions, everything, right? To play in that game, you have to be able to hook up whatever you got into the new world that's evolving every day. And this is just whatever we can see now from based on technology now. In another five years, it's going to be different. Ten years, is going to be something else, right? In 20 years, who knows what, what, what's going to be? We have no idea how much technology can evolve. Uh, open source, I, I'm a long time proponent of open source, but open source is very important because open source gives you control, right? It, 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 the fact that it is open means it usually, and I don't mean the fact that you have source code because typically you, you have the source code but you, the customer doesn't have the competence to deal with the source code. So it doesn't really do you any good having the source code. What matters is open source software is generally architected for openness. Open source software, because they consume other people's stuff, because they expect to be consumed as software and other people's stuff, generally have a much better architecture than non-open source software. Uh, that is why open source is better. Uh, yeah, and if you guys want to hack and give us a patch for the source code, we happily appreciate that, but most people don't do that anymore. Uh, the other one is the leadership in a business has to be software empowered, right? Not many uh, boards of companies understand the importance of software into the business yet. And those who take too long to understand it won't be having a board for very long. Uh, and and the, trans the, the impact of the, uh, uh, you know, I mean, you all know the stories of Airbnb to Uber to all these kind of things that are radically affecting legacy businesses uh, and, and who cannot operate in that scale, in that performance level, in that real-time behavior. Uh, so the change, come, when it comes from radical innovation, comes very fast. Uh, banking, I think, uh, I can't remember, Utah, some U.S. state just allowed uh, uh, Google or somebody to do banking. Uh, Amazon, maybe some, some one of these guys got a banking license for that. Right? Once these internet companies are allowed to do banking, they operate at a different scale of software infrastructure. Right? If, if you want to know how, how bad it can be for a company that's not software ready, in India, uh, there was a new telco that formed a few years ago called Reliance Geo. Uh, India had Airtel and there were like six, seven major telcos. They all, you know, happily chugging along. They all had market share. Reliance Geo went from zero to 100 million customers in three months. And Reliance Geo has a very simple package, 495 rupees, I think. All you can eat. All data, all voice, all SMS, 495 rupees. And it's a 4G only network. And it's not a phone, actually. It's just a content delivery network is what they built. And the entire platform is all about content. They inverted the phone market into a content platform. And yeah, by, yeah, you have get an access device. It happens to be a 4G phone, right? And, and they, are, they are now, uh, uh, I think, two or three uh, large Indian telcos merge because they can no longer compete. Uh, and Airtel has had, uh, uh, it's a public company, they had two or three quarters of negative uh, their losses for, for first time ever because Geo is just eating the shit out of them, right? That's, that's how fast things can change, right? I think they have like 300 million customers now. All right, I think I'm done. Uh, so in summary, so to me, a, 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 uh, the future of everything is about being able to evolve and being able to adopt technology and being able to eat it and do stuff with it very, very fast and be always open to that. And that can only happen if you have an organization, culture, organization, environment, organization, system that fosters innovation, fosters entrepreneurship, and fosters empowerment, gives people the right to do stuff and doesn't screw them over if they get something wrong and so forth. And software is, of course, the heart of it all. So if you don't have the software competency, obviously people here are very software competent. That's why you guys are here. This is a software conference, right? Uh, the, what I'm saying basically is you guys should be the center of whatever the company you're working for. If you're not, get them to make you the center because otherwise they're going to go away. Thank you very much. <laughs>